I'm Leonard Garrison. I'm the flute professor at the University of Idaho, and I'm here to tell you about this wonderful gem from the early 20th century, The Romance by Georges Brun. And this is a, a great piece for, to play for a solo and ensemble if you're in junior high, middle school, or maybe early high school. And it is kind of a, a stepping stone towards those great French conservatory contest pieces like the Forêt Fantasy and the Inesco Cantabile and Presto. Um, it's, it's a necessary prelude to those pieces. So little is known about the composer Georges Brun, whose name in French means Brown, George Brown, um, except for the fact that he died in uh, 1961, and he was born in 1878. And he wrote this beautiful romance in 1905. He dedicated it to an important flutist, Georges Berrer, who was a French flutist who immigrated to New York. And he taught many important American flutists, including my teacher, Samuel Barron. So Many of us Americans have a connection to Georges Berrer, uh, the dedicatee of this piece. Now, the instrumental romance is a favorite genre for romantic composers. It's usually in an ABA form, like this one is. And um, it's usually a lyrical piece, a song-like piece. So we have to sing on the flute in order to play one of these. And so prior to playing this piece, make sure that you have a beautiful sound. Spend some time each day playing slow things and listen to your sound. Also spend some time each day listening to good models. Listen to professional flutists. Find one that you love to listen to and emulate their sound. So another thing prior to playing this piece is since it, is in G major, review your G major scale. I always like to play the scale of a piece before I play the actual piece. And one thing about the G major scale is make sure you have proper fingerings because your sound is gonna be so much better and your intonation is going to be so much better. So uh, one common fault in the G major scale is using the wrong fingering for F sharp. And F sharp, uh, the proper fingering is with thumb one, two, three, and then the ring finger of the right hand and the pinky. And uh, many young flutists use this middle finger and the sound is not as good. I'll show you comparing. So the sound is a little muffled this way and uh, flatter in pitch. So this is much better. So, and practice your G major scale in two octaves with that good F sharp fingering. So here we go, G major scale. Concentrating on getting an even sound throughout your registers. Another thing to do prior to actually playing this piece is to locate and identify various elements such as scales and arpeggios. For instance, in measure seven, beat two, there's a nice little C major arpeggio. Also, in measure nine, beat two, there's a dominant seventh chord on E. So the notes are E, G sharp, B, and D. Another little element that I'd like to point out is measure 23, beat four. This is what we call an augmented triad. The notes are A, C sharp, and F natural. a favorite sound of French composers. 
And then, of course, there's a grand chromatic scale in measure 34, going all the way from the low D to the high D. And it's good to practice this grouping it in four notes per beat. Now, talking about fingering, one mistake that some flutists make is using the thumb B-flat. I love this fingering for B-flat, but not here in the chromatic scale because it's really difficult to slide your thumb from this position to this position. So in this instance, I like to use what I call one and one B-flat or lever, which is right here. Another element that you'll find in this piece is in measure 37, a G major arpeggio going down. And then several measures later, or two measures later, in measure 38, the F sharp minor arpeggio. In measure 42, we have a G major scale. It's a little tricky because it starts on the note D. And then that's followed by a C major scale that starts on the note E. And that's followed by a G minor scale. And then finally, in measure 58, there's a D major arpeggio. So these are some of the elements that we should know and we should practice separately from the piece so they don't give us any problems when we actually play the piece. Now we're ready to actually play the piece. And the tempo marking is in French. Modéré sans lenteur, which means moderately, but not slow. And I like quarter note equals 80 for this tempo. Now, here at the beginning of the piece, we have a wonderful singing theme in the low register. So you have to employ a nice, rich sound with vibrato. And I think of myself as a French baritone when I, when I play such a theme in the low register. Now, how do we get a big sound down there? Well, we have to keep our head up, but we angle the air down into the flute from a high position. Much better than. And another thing we must do is inside our mouth, we have to make the cavity in our mouth as big as possible. It's like a big cave in there. If we put our teeth together, no sound. If we drop our jaw, make a big opening inside, big sound. Think in phrases. This is very important in French music and bring out all of the dynamic ups and downs, the inflections marked in the score and very important to decide where to breathe. Mostly, we breathe between slurs, as follows. so on. Now, an important detail of articulation is if you have a slur and you have a repeated note, you must re-tongue that note. And this occurs very often in this piece, for instance, in measure three. Where the B is re-articulated. And you can look for many other places in the piece where there is a slur and despite that, 
we have to tongue the repeated note. Every time you play a solo, you have to study the piano score so that you know how the flute and the piano interact. So a good thing to know at the beginning is that the piano has eighth notes, a measure of eighth notes before you enter. One and two and three and four. That way you know when, where to come in. And in fact, the piano has eighth notes through this whole first section of the piece with one exception, and this is very important. Measure 11, they just have a chord on the downbeat. And when that happens, when the motion in the piano stops, it gives you a little invitation to play a little freely. Now, there are many instances of grace notes in this piece, and we have to fit them in very carefully. They always occur between beats. So in measure 11, we have a great double grace note before the third beat. And a good way to practice that is leave the grace notes out at first. Try to fit the grace notes in without affecting the rhythm of the other notes. And by the way, those two grace notes in measure 11, you finger as you would an E to F sharp trill, E, F sharp, with that forbidden F sharp fingering. <laughs> in measure 12, the French un peu retenu means hold back a little, a little retard in that measure. And by the way, the piano has the same rhythm as the flute, so we should coordinate very carefully with them. And the end of the phrase is on beat three, which gives us a three, no three note pickup to the following section. Now this three note pickup has dashes on each note, tenuto marks, and that means to tongue in a legato fashion. So measure 12 is something like this. Now let's listen to our performance of the first section of the piece, measures 1 through 12. In measure 13, then, we have the French un peu animé, which means a little animated. Push the tempo a little bit here, and I play approximately quarter equals 88, a little faster than the beginning. You can also show the increased animation with the speed of your vibrato and more color or harmonics in the sound. At measure 17, toujours animé means always more animated. So we push even more at this place. Uh, my tempo is about quarter equals 92. And the French word chaleureux means with warmth. All the fl although the flute here is marked mezzo forte, the piano is marked pianissimo, and there's a totally new harmony at this place. So I like to play somewhat less than mezzo forte to show this new color. In measure 21, there is a subrio pianissimo, and there's a reason for this. The flute and piano change roles. The piano now has the tune and the flute functions as an accompaniment. So after we start pianissimo, notice that there's a crescendo and there's a big buildup 
into measure 23, followed by a rallentando. And in this place, there is the same kind of phrasing. We end the phrase on beat four, take a breath, and put a three note pickup to the next section. We return to the original tempo at measure 24, where it says plus calme, or calmer. And you can play quietly here and relax your vibrato. And remember that we had a more intense vibrato earlier for the animated section. Well, now let's listen to the next section of the piece, measures 13 through 28. Now we come to the middle section of the piece in measure 29. And the French here, plus long, means slower. And it's still in four, it's 12-8 rather than 4-4. Four, four. And the beat here, I play at approximately quarter, dotted quarter equals 60. One must be an opera star here, again, a big theme in the low register where it says in French, très expressif et chanté, which means very expressive and singing. Make sure to shape this line up and down. The next flute entrance features the chromatic scale that we worked upon earlier. And it's a good idea to practice this with a metronome so that you can fit 12 notes in each beat. And you group these 12 notes in three groups of four. Of course, you could start your practicing slower and work up to that speed. Now there's an interesting rhythm after the chromatic scale in measure 34, it says two, and that means two notes per beat rather than the normal three. And there's another duple at the end of the next bar. Three and then two. Another thing about this location of the piece is there are two groups of seven. This is while the piano has eighth notes, groups of three to a beat. Bum, 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 bum. So how do we play these sevens? Well, I like to do them two plus two plus three. One, two, one, two, one, two, three, one. And then they coordinate well with the piano. However, I try not to do it too mechanically because that's not the idea here. At the end of bar 38, we start a little transition. So the dynamics suddenly softer and the mood is suddenly calmer. However, at the end of 42, it says anime, which in French was, means go faster, get more excited. And that's where we have these scales. Each scale should get a little bit louder and a little bit faster. 
We have an interesting situation in bar 44 where the piano has a rallentando for two beats and then the flute enters and the composer says premier mouvement or tempo primo, back to the original tempo. However, the original theme does not occur until the next downbeat. And the composer writes an interesting word in the piano part, suivre, which means follow the flute, and which implies that the flute is going to stretch or do something interesting. So the tempo should not, in fact, occur in the middle of bar 44, but right on the downbeat of 45. Now we can listen to the middle section of this piece, measures 29 through 44. Then we have a return of our original theme and everything we said about this theme originally uh, applies to this last section of the piece. Now let's listen to the return of the main theme in our performance, measures 44 through 55. In bar 56, we have a coda, which means the final resolution of the piece. And while the flute is holding its D in this measure, be aware that the piano plays triplets. At the flute entrance in bar 57, the French is sans lenteur avec un peu d'action, which means without being slow, with a little bit of forward motion animation. So my tempo here is slightly faster, quarter equals 84. And I'll let you in on a little secret. I cheat with my fingering in this measure to make it much easier to play. Let me explain. When I alternate between D and E, I don't use the right hand pinky because I'm going fast enough that that won't really be noticed. And then in the middle of the bar, this is one good place to use the middle finger F sharp as we trill from E to F sharp. So the middle of that bar is so 
those fingerings will help you get through that measure, which otherwise can be very difficult. Now notice we have a similar phrasing to what we've had all along in measure 60. The phrase ends right on beat four, and that's a good place to breathe. And then we have another three note pickup into the next section. We return to our original tempo in measure 61, and this is a gorgeous final statement of the theme. And listen to the harmony in this place. Harmony is really the secret of musical expression. So the harmony in the second measure is much more intense and more interesting and expressive. So you should shape the flute line accordingly, making a crescendo to the second measure, diminuendo to the third measure. One of my favorite parts of this piece is in measure 65 and 66. The piano is really not playing much here. So again, this gives the flute a little liberty to do something very interesting. It's like a little cadenza. I like to bring out the repeat of the motive, which starts on the second 16th. and then it repeats at a higher level, and then it repeats at a yet a higher level. So you can show, rather than playing straight through, you can show the repeat of this motive. Another interesting idea here is to pretend you're on a bicycle. You're starting at the top of a hill, you go downhill and you start to go faster, and then you go uphill again and you go slower. Each one of these little phrases goes down and up. Now notice I varied a little bit how I did each one because we would get seasick um, while doing each one exactly the same way. Now what the composer does here is very interesting. He goes from 16th notes with a beautiful transition into a trill. Each pair of 16th notes is slurred by twos. So one must finger the 16th notes and then you can transition into your trill fingering. Now on the trill itself, listen to the piano part which plays chords on beats two, three, and four before you move to your C sharp. Then linger on the C sharp teasing your audience, delaying the final resolution of the piece. Now the last note is in fact very difficult and very typical for how many of these lyrical or song-like pieces ends. It ends with a taper. And on the flute, uh, tapers are dangerous things to do because we either tend to fall into the lower octave or we go flat. Or we don't do any taper at all and have a rather crude cutoff. So how do we do this taper thing? 
The secret is to keep the air going at exactly the same speed all the way through the note to the very end. But in the meantime, we gradually push the air out and up, making a forward and up motion with our lips. One of my students used to call this kissing the note away. <laughs> so you're actually lifting the air over the flute as you do this. In the meantime, the size of the opening between the lips is decreased so you bring your lips further and further together. A good exercise is, in fact, to trap the air between your lips, just as an exercise. One thing to notice about this final note is the flute releases on the downbeat, but actually the piano sustains one beat past the flute. So it's not necessary to cut off with the piano. Let them sound a little bit longer than the flute. Now the performance of the coda measures 56 through the end. I hope that playing this gorgeous piece inspires you to perform more French music, eventually working your way up to the major contest pieces of the Paris Conservatory. So, bonne chance, or good luck. <laughs>